Five to six shots rang out. It was hard to keep count. The cries of two little girls pleading for their life from the very man that is supposed to be the one protecting them. Their mother listens from the other side of the phone call. Run, babies, run, she screams, bound by the distance between herself and the two reasons for her very being. She fought her ex-husband to protect herself, but never imagined that she would have to protect them from their own father. Deep Ellum is the, quote, Texas destination for arts, music, culture, and innovation since 1873, end quote. The music, art, and culture beyond what Texas is known for fills the streets. Deep Ellum is an experience. When visiting the DFW area, just above the heart of Texas, you cannot say you've seen it unless you walk the streets in Deep Ellum. Most people pass by the historic district without even knowing, as it is a mere 10-minute drive east from the famous book depository, and there you are. Mingling with the late nightlife, dancing to music, gazing at eccentric pieces of art, not just that on the walls and canvases, but decorating the people wandering around with you. But behind the socialness of the area is a dark red mark on the district's history. At the corner of Canton and Henry Street sets Adam Hat Lofts. Behind the door of 418 sets the loft in which this gruesome crime occurred. Just feet inside the door is where one of the girls laid, riddled with bullet holes and one shot execution style into the back of her head. Further inside of the apartment lay the other. She too is riddled with bullets. And make no mistake, she suffered the same execution as her sister. Lining the walls were books, boxes, and furniture, along with 15 guns, including the 38 revolver responsible for making the bullet wounds in both girls, and the Glock with both girls' flesh, hair, and blood still snagged in the end of the barrel. Father's love is timeless, forever lasting, but what could cause it to shift and take the lives of the two girls who wanted nothing more than their father's love? Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we come to the big state of Texas, where the people are friendly until you do something as heinous as killing your children to teach your ex-wife a lesson. Then you get the Texas that makes headlines and is the root of most anti-capital punishments groups hate. We are known for the speedy process from the sentence of death to the actual death chamber. It's jokingly called the express lane. No matter which side of that line you stand on, picketing and protesting the death of an inmate or cheering the countdown until the toxic cocktail is pumped into the arm of a murderer. You can't seem to disagree with the sentence handed down to John David Battaglia Jr., February 1st, 2018. Tonight, I introduce you to a man never more deserving of the sentence of death. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of emotional abuse, domestic abuse, and murder. Listeners' discretion is strongly advised. If any of this may be too much for you, please, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you.
Good evening, all of my true crime nerds. We have the usual housekeeping. Please continue to spread the word about TDCL and the cases we've covered thus far. There is more room for listeners and we welcome them. Remember to review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening on so that you never miss an episode. Head over to the truecrimelibrarian.com and check out the webpage as we are adding to it as we can. From there, you can head over to the merch store and pick up some great gear to represent the show, or if capable, you can donate to the show. Reviewing, recommending, or donating are all great ways to help keep the show up and running. Diving deep into the cases you want to hear and those making waves in the headlines. Finally, let's spread some of that true crime nerd love to some of those who have donated, reviewed, or recommended. Andrea Purito, thank you for being a part of my nerds, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Nick, please tell me that you're a real librarian too. Thank you for the review, but give it a shot. It may grow on you. Lise Masluck, thank you for giving TTCL a go and hope you are here to stay. And finally, Carolyn Duchesnes, you have been here from the beginning and have been supporting me since. And for that, I cannot thank you enough. Now to what you all came here for, the true crime. Let me introduce you to John David Battaglia Jr., born August 2, 1955, to John Battaglia Sr. and Julia Christie, on a military base in Alabama, the couple's first child. John Sr. served in the Army Medical Corps as a specialist in logistics, and John Sr. joined just after marrying Julia. John Jr. has two younger brothers and two younger sisters. And the family moved around due to John Sr. being in the military. Moving around like nomads is hard on the psyche of not only the children, but the spouse as well. Julia suffered from severe depression. Having a mental illness during these decades was treated like the plague, and you were committed. You could be depressed, but on the outside, you had to present yourself as happy and healthy. John was the apple of his mother's eye, and he struggled for the approval of his father, who he was named after. If John did something to anger his father, his mother was quick to shush him and send him on to his room to curb the burst of angers that his father was very prone to. John Sr. disciplined his children like a military sergeant, and hitting them was a common thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not damning anybody who spanks their children. Discipline is based off the child and the parent and what works best for you. But there's a difference between discipline and abuse. When we talk about the abuse pattern of a person, typically we can go into their background and see a pattern of abuse in their childhood. And with John, we see the same pattern. The difference is the level of physical abuse from John Sr. to Julia. It was common during that time for a man to raise his hand to his wife, quote, putting her in her place. And mothers would tell their daughter to change their behavior so the husband would not hit her again. This, we can see, shows the children, especially young men, that it's okay to hit your spouse. It also shows your daughters to hide who they truly are and cave to the demand of their spouse. This is not healthy in the way, and we've learned from that. I mean, we've progressed. Unfortunately, domestic violence is still highly prevalent in today's society, and it's never okay for a man to raise his hand to a woman, but women, it's never okay for you to raise your hand to the man, you know. The level of psychology that stems from this type of home life can be detrimental to society. John Sr. finally did retire from his position in the military as a lieutenant colonel. He he took a civilian job in Oregon at a local hospital as the hospital administrator and emergency service manager, thanks to his background from the military. John Jr. was finally in a place where he felt he could be home. 
And just as he was entering into high school, John made the football team and he began building friendships with his fellow classmates, something he was not prone to doing since the family moved so frequently before. John's sophomore year comes around and John Sr. announces he's taking the position in New York City. He was holding on to the fact that he had this chance to start this first addict ran drug clinic and first publicly financed abortion clinic in the country. And it was an opportunity that he couldn't give up. So he packed up his family and drove them from the coast of the Pacific to the coast of the Atlantic. The family would find their home in Dumont, New Jersey, a tiny town compared to its neighboring cities. And John was still struggling to get his father's attention, approval, and more. And John was very ambitious in giving his father something that he could be proud of. But John Sr. never really gave that pride to him. Now, Julia was institutionalized for 18 days for her depression in the Inglewood Hospital. She was coping with that depression by drinking heavily, which in turn only made the problem worse. And on December 5th of 1972, John Sr. announced that he was going to send Julia to Bergen Pines, a psychiatric hospital in New Jersey. This was terrifying to Julia. She viewed this as going into a prison where the key would be thrown away. And she went into hysteria to the point that a doctor finally had to be called to the home to administer a sedative. The next morning, John Jr. watched as the whole thing unfolded. He was just 17 years old and learning how to be an adult. And his role model was an unforgiving father and a mother on the brink of a breakdown who would concede to keep the peace. So there was nothing there teaching John how to properly take care of his spouse, take care of your children, to grow your family without the violence or the threat of violence or the emotional abuse or the physical abuse. John was not learning the right way to do things. And the older he got, the more he found it acceptable to continue the pattern. On December 6th of 1972, Julia climbed into her old Buick and drove to a spot just across the Hudson River in New York. It was close to West Point, and it was a beautiful scenic spot. With a 9mm Glock, she took her life. Her body was found around the 2 o'clock hour. The last person to talk to her that morning was the son she doted on, John Jr., John probably took his mother's death the hardest, and rumors were exploding around their tiny town about his father and the abuse that might have happened behind closed door. But John felt like there was more that he could have done to save his mother. John coped by throwing himself into schoolwork, and he ended up graduating in three years instead of the four it typically t it took. John Sr. would marry his second wife, Kathy, just a year after the death of his first wife. And at that point, John Jr. entered into Fairleigh Dixon University, and he was studying pre-med. He was going to fo follow his father's footsteps. But it only took him a year to realize that he was exceptionally good at math and would switch his major over to accounting. Now, at home... Junior was still taking the brunt of the discipline from Senior. John Jr. developed the same explosive rage, once pulling a gun on his brother after being taunted as emotionally crippled. In 1976, John Jr., well into his college career, was easily convinced to drop his course load and tour with the rock band Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. This was his first taste of freedom and a way to escape the abuse, both mental and physical, coming from being at home with his father. But in 1977, the tour was over and John was no closer to going back to college than he was the day he walked away from it all. 
He toyed with the idea of dropping accounting and going into an art school, and this played on his mind. But he was unable to make that final decision in his future, and John found himself spiraling into a drug addiction. The powdery substance started to take the country by storm was his drug of choice. He loved cocaine. It helped John in a way nothing else really had. He found that his outbursts were less frequent and the unsettling mood swings were mostly stable while he was on the drug. But due to this, John had his first encounter with the police thanks to this new addiction and he was charged with delivery of a controlled substance and received a suspended sentence. As you can imagine, it didn't go over well with his father. In order to escape the charge and possibly get his life back on track, John Jr. enlisted. He was with the Marine Corps. It suited his hot-headed tendencies and the aggressive lion that is his Zodiac. For four years, John was back on the nomad lifestyle of his younger years. But in 1982, John decided to take his honorable discharge and went back to college. It had been long enough, and now he needed to finish his CPA degree. Wanting to be close to his father, out of hope he would not only impress him, but earn a proud father when he went to live with him and his stepmother in Dallas, Texas. There, John was just beginning his career, and his stepmother, who worked for, I guess, a photography place, talked John into taking some headshots and submitting them and encouraged him as he was a very handsome, this is not my opinion, FYI, man of that time. Now, John, he's struggling. He's got modeling going on. He's in the accountant career at a low level, and he's still taking class to finish CPA his CPA license. And it wasn't long before the boy finally earned exactly what he was striving for and his career was on a path of being successful. So John had this amazing career that he was building the foundation for and now the father that he always sought approval from was finally giving it to him. In 1984, John was just a few hours short of having his license. Those who knew John on another level than that of wife number one and wife number two did call him outgoing and charming. He could mold to any social gathering he was attending. John's best friend was an attorney with Akin Gump Firm as a bankruptcy lawyer, and he knew the perfect woman introduced to John. This would lead to John's very first marriage and an insight into who John David Battaglia Jr. really was. Let me introduce you to Michelle Ward Getty. After her divorce in 1980, Michelle took her young son and off she went to Louisiana State University Law Center and began the path to becoming a very prominent attorney, professor, and lawmaker. In May of 1983, Michelle graduated first in the class of 184 from law school. She would take her son and the job offer from Akin Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Field in Dallas, Texas, just a state away from the life she was used to. Michelle, the young new bankruptcy and estate lawyer, would meet her second husband, John David Battaglia Jr., and he was quite the charmer. As a single mother, her first and foremost, was doing what was best for her son. And if John and she were going to date, then he needed to know about her son. And when John found out, he was thrilled. And at points during their courtship, Michelle even wondered if he was only with her for the relationship he had with her son. John warmed up to his future stepson quickly, always making time to spend with him whenever John went to Michelle's or make plans that would that her son could attend with them. On New Year's Eve of 1984, Michelle's son was going back to Louisiana to spend spend some of the holiday with his father. 
This left Michelle and John free to go on their own little getaway. A friend of hers from New York was going to be out of town and offered his apartment to Michelle and her boyfriend of three months. Michelle and John jumped on the chance to have this romantic weekend away and flew out for the first vacation they would spend together. And possibly she would experience the first red flag of John's canter. Michelle swears that during the time they were there, she had ran out to the grocery store and during that time, John took something because when she came back, there was John and he just had the, this expression, almost goofiness to him when she returned. Now, John was adamantly denying that he took anything and Michelle ended up letting it go, but it's something that bothered her through their whole relationship. It always kind of nagged at the back of her mind that John may be dabbling in explosive drugs. And if so, could that play a part in the person she was going to come to know very quickly? Now, during this time, Michelle and John were intimate for the first time. And I choose to point this out because I think when Two people are first intimate in their relationship. It shows an attachment that makes ending the relationship quite difficult, especially if there is time like with John and Michelle, where they were able to sit down, talk about themselves and develop an emotional connection before the intimate connection was created. So I think this was... This is the recipe you want for a successful relationship, but this was a toxic recipe for Michelle. February of 1985, just a month or so from the incident in New York, the couple decided they were going to go and celebrate Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And in the process, John was going to be able to meet Michelle's parents and family. They decided to drive and Michelle didn't realize that her first glimpse into John's explosive behavior would rear its ugly head during that drive. Nearing Baton Rouge, John was driving, and a car full of teenagers roared past them and got in front of them and then slowed down, and this pissed John off like no other. Michelle later says that his face visibly changed during this encounter. he John decided he needed something from the duffel bag and he was digging around on the floorboard looking for the bag. An already scary thing as his attention is no longer on driving and with the car of teenagers playing around, an accident was highly likely. So Michelle offered to get the duffel bag until John revealed what he wanted. He decided it was a good idea to bring a handgun with him, quote, for cases like this, end quote. Michelle refused, knowing the gun would only escalate the situation, so she threw the bag out of his reach, and John decided he'd handle it a different way, and he floored it around the car, and while passing, he had some choice words to be used explicitly foul language that Michelle had never heard him use before spewed from him at this point as his anger was magnified. After the situation and the teenagers were long gone in their rearview mirror, Michelle decided to confront him about bringing the gun. His response was the dangers of Mardi Gras. It was to protect them. But this scene changed the way she looked at John. Once they got back to Dallas after this incident, Michelle decided she was no longer interested in pursuing a relationship with John. And then she found out she was pregnant. Michelle was on birth control and she took them like she was supposed to. But you and I both know it's not 100%. The idea of having another child was exciting. Michelle didn't want her son growing up as an only child. However, having a child out of wedlock wasn't exactly appropriate. So Michelle wrote her mother. 
she had a lot to think about with John, a, a man who was starting to really scare her. Michelle told her mother about her situation and was hoping for some guidance on whether her solution was the right one. And I think initially Michelle wanted to have their child, but not get married. Does that make sense? It's 1985, early. She's contemplating becoming a single mother. She's already a single mother because she and her husband divorced and she now had her son. But this was different because she had her son while they were married. And this child was not conceived in a marriage. And this, for Southern people at the time, was a big fat no-no. So instead of some support and some guidance, she was met with disappointment from her mother. Under her mother's advice, and even further into her pregnancy, Michelle decided to marry John on April 28th of 1985 in a tiny courthouse room with just the justice of the peace. One month into their marriage, John disappeared for two days, and then he blindsided Michelle about where he had been. He picked up the phone, he called home, and he told her he was coming home, he would be there quickly, and he was going to explain everything. Well, when he got home, Michelle found out John had been hiding out at his kind of ex-girlfriend's house, Janet. As you can tell, <clears throat> this is not the greatest news. But with John's big day of being awarded his CPA license, Michelle stewed on the confession from her husband until that was over. Because no other family members of John's had called to acknowledge him passing his exams, nor were they there to attend the licensing ceremony. But once they were back, their friend, Mark, who had introduced the two, offered his apartment to John, Michelle, and Janet, the kind of ex-girlfriend of John's. And Mark took Michelle's son out so that he wasn't there for the confrontation and the three of them could have a, an adult conversation. John stood between the two women, both living a different reality with John. John told Janet he was no longer in love with her and he was in love with Michelle and he needed to end their relationship. Now later, Michelle would learn that John and Janet were actually planning their own makeshift family. John was going to leave Michelle after the baby was born and take their child, marry Janet, and then John and Janet would raise the new child as their own. Because something that, uh, John failed to mention when he met Michelle was he was kind of sort of engaged to Janet. He left that tidbit out. Now, Michelle was five months along and the small family of three were going to soon be four. So John and Michelle began looking for a bigger home. John had moved in with Michelle into her small two-bedroom home. One night, as she's packing, after they have found their new home, getting ready to move, she calls out to John, who is sitting in the living room watching TV, and asks if he could come help her pack. His response was, quote, nah, most of it's yours. I don't see why I should pack it, end quote. Well, first of all, if I was five months pregnant, hormonal, stressed from the upcoming mood, I probably would have hurled the vacuum cleaner at his head. So we should, you know, have a moment of kudos for Michelle for not blowing, for being able to blow it off because I would have picked up the nearest, heaviest object and chunked it. Later, she finishes packing the box she was working on. She goes into the living room, walks past him, and again, she asks for his help. All of a sudden, 
John jumps up from where he's sitting. He grabs Michelle around the neck in this type of chokehold, and he says, quote, I'll help when I'm good and ready, if at all. Do you understand? End quote. Not only was Michelle hurting from being locked in the crook of his elbow, she's terrified. She had never experienced domestic abuse before. Her mother and her father had a very loving marriage, and she was raised in a very loving home. Her first husband never laid a finger on her despite their differences. The two just simply grew apart. When Michelle was let go, she shoved him and she went to the bathroom. She needed to collect herself because the man that scared her in Baton Rouge on the trip to Louisiana had just terrified her with his coolness of the whole situation occurring from the living room. He was too collected for that kind of, for that level of violence. Michelle begins to wonder, had she married a monster? Well, when she came out of the bathroom, there's John in the master bedroom, packing a box as if nothing had happened. Then one night, one cool night in October, after the first incident of abuse, Michelle was cooking for her family. They had moved into their new home. John and her son were in the living room and they were playing around. The phone rang, she picked it up, and she was talking to her mother until she heard John tell his stepson that was enough. Kind of like a it's time to calm down kind of thing. His stepson begged for five more minutes, and then there was a loud thud and a piercing scream that followed. Michelle dropped the phone, took off to the living room where she saw her son clutching his arm and quickly telling her, He threw me against the wall. Michelle couldn't believe John had just harmed her son in this way. She always believed that the two had this very special bond. And now she was scared for more than what she would endure next, but what her son may experience at the hands of John. John quickly claims, you know, it was an accident. I was done playing. I meant to throw him to the couch and he hit the wall. It it was a little too hard. My bad kind of thing. Well, not a week later, her son does something and John kicks him hard enough to rise the child's feet from the floor. Michelle was appalled at John and his actions and she was going to make herself very clear. John was not to do that again. In their bedroom, John replied and promised he wouldn't. What had gotten into John? This is not the man she came to know before their breakup. However, Michelle had caught a glimpse of him and was quick to end things. But now she felt bound to John because of the child she was carrying. Is this really what she signed up for? But the good times in their marriage, despite the recent event, John and her son had a great relationship and Michelle toyed with the idea of leaving her husband, but it's those good moments she was afraid to give away. Because when things are good, things are great. When things are bad, things are terrible. In the end, Michelle decided to stay and taught her husband a very valuable lesson. John could get away with his outburst, and more importantly, he could continue to abuse her and her son. On November 10th of 1985, Christy Battaglia was born, John's first biological child, a little girl no doubt named after her beloved grandmother. With the birth of their child, John shifted the abuse back to Michelle and never touched her son again. What people do not realize is, with an abuser, they will continue to hit his or her spouse until they are noticeably carrying a child. At that point, the abuser will shift his target to another family member, generally a young child, while the spouse is in this delicate state. However, once that period ends, 
the abuse is shifted back and ramped up. Michelle started to pick up on the abuse pattern, and John seemingly exploded every three months, almost on the dot. As the time stressors built on his shoulders and without an outlet really for him, he was a ticking time bomb, and the littlest thing would trip the wire and set him off. John was putting his hands on his wife almost every three months, like clockwork. Once he exploded, they would enter into what's called the honeymoon phase of the cycle. To pretend to be remorseful of what they had done, the abuser will shower the victim with gifts, with promises, with excessive attention, all to woo the victim back to their side. Then that phase tapers off and the in-between areas are there and then the snide rock snide remarks and cruel comments begin dominating the conversation and that gradually worsens until the explosion happens again and we start over. In 1986 Michelle had decided that the nanny that they had hired to help Michelle with the children was just becoming a bigger problem than she was worth. She barely spoke English, and she was constantly neglecting the children and her duties. For John, this is tax season and the stressors of his career path. He exploded over the desire to talk, not actually make him go out and fire the nanny. No, he exploded over the fact that Michelle wanted to talk to him about the nanny and her future with the family. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. John got into Michelle's face, screaming at her that when he was ready to talk about it, then they would talk about it. Not a moment sooner. His finger was in her face and he backed her all the way to the wall in the breakfast area. When he could no longer back her up, he began hitting her in the chest, bruising the already sore area as she's still nursing Christy. Michelle broke. The realization that every outburst she reasoned it was due to one thing or another, all the while teaching John just what he could get away with. And in this moment, she's holding her chest as he pounded away. She decided she wasn't going to become one of the late night news stories, a better woman who should have got out long ago. She yelled at John to leave her house, and she was through with what he had become. Unfortunately, Michelle didn't stick to her guns, and a new pattern emerged. John would leave for the night, then he would return with promises to change, promises to not do it again, promises to seek counseling. Michelle had developed an almost quarterly groundhog movie style lifestyle, where in the movie, nothing changes until the right action is done. Michelle's life had a different dialogue and changed with the season, but the cycle was still the same. In the summer of 1986, John opened up to his wife. He went into the bedroom one morning as she's still laying in bed trying to hold on to just a few more minutes of sleep and he said he's quitting his job to pursue his dream of working in the world of art first he would need to go to art school michelle was confused by what she had just heard his confession shocked her but surely he couldn't be serious could he Michelle worked, and she made decent money, but they had two children, one still an infant. So why make this decision now? Well, this pissed John off. You know, how could his very own wife doubt him and shoot down his dream? So John balled his fist, and Michelle managed to turn just in time for his fist to connect with her body over and over again. She screamed at him to stop. She crawled to the other side of the bed and fell into the floor and got as far under her bed as she could to hide from her very angry husband. 
and she screamed for him to leave. Thankfully, John left. Well, surprise, surprise, John charms his way back in, this time actually pursuing counseling. The counseling he had promised to get time and time before, but never really made that first step, he was finally doing that. And when the couple had good times, they were the best times. But when the couple had bad times, John was violent. He was hot-headed. He was abusive. But he was the father of her daughter and the stepfather to her son, and they had a relationship. Together, they were a family. And as a wife, you work to keep your family together. So let's not show the world the bad side of marriage. Outwardly, Michelle acted as though everything was just fine. Inside, she was terrified of the man that John could become. September 5th of 1986, John's anger was boiling over and the ever-cautious Michelle had been choosing her steps very carefully and her words even more so. He put his fist through the glass shower wall in their master bathroom. Michelle rushed in to him and in shock at what he had done. She offered to take her husband to the emergency room, but John chose to go along. And Michelle didn't plead to change his mind, which was wise. When John came home later, his arm was in a cast as he had severed a tendon in his hand. Two days later, Michelle was in the nursery with Christy when John decided to pick a fight. He accused Michelle of ignoring him. And when Michelle said she wasn't, she was just in this quiet mood here lately, John accused her of thinking she was better than him. She and her hot lawyer friends looked down their noses at John. The next explosion was here and off John went. He flew at her across the room, raising the newly casted fist, and Michelle turned her head in anticipation of that swing, and John connected with the side of her head. She had little Christy in her arms. She went down, and she tried to protect her daughter from getting hurt, but the blow had disoriented Michelle, and she heard the thud of Christy's head hitting against the wall. The final siren of the blaring warning signs had gone off, and Michelle knew at that moment the last ounce of love she had for John was gone. His attacks were getting worse, and the next one could very well take her life. Michelle grabbed her son and her daughter, and they went to the neighbor's house. From there, she called the police and finally reported her husband for domestic abuse. Michelle did go to work the next day, but her at the insistence of her assistant, she ended up at Prima Healthcare Facility and received treatments for her injuries. The following week, after Michelle felt like she had recouped from that injury, she filed for divorce from John Battaglia. No amount of sweet talking was going to change her mind this time. John didn't stray far from his wife in their home. He rented a one-bedroom apartment just a block away behind a home similar to that that he had shared with Michelle. It was 10 steps down in John's eye, and he was only more soured by the conditions of the small apartment. But from this distance, he could still keep a watchful eye on his wife, who quickly became known as the bitch to John. To make Michelle pay, John quit his job at the advice of his lawyer. This way, Michelle would have to pay him child support and spousal support. Michelle had taken herself to go get counseling. What she had been through wasn't going to define the rest of her life. She spent weeks seeking counseling. Michelle was instructed to stay strong with John her counselor noticed that Michelle was capable of caving to John to avoid further mistreatment. And with those words being said out loud to Michelle, it helped her keep her once unstable feet on the ground, and she wouldn't let John push her around. John was ordered to counseling from the courts for his anger issues. Now, John's counselor would meet with Michelle 
and he further encouraged her to stand her ground. The thought is John will back down as he has a hard time standing up to someone who won't let him have his way, similar to his father. But what they failed to see in John was his outlook on the female role. His mother was a weak alcoholic who couldn't stand up to his father in John's eyes. Because of this, what made other women think they could stand up to John Jr.? And through this delusion, John would be met with acceptance and pride from his father, whose relationship is still strained. Michelle took her son and daughter and she flew home. She filed for divorce with one of the cruelest men she had ever known. And now it was time to tell her parents exactly what it was like to be married to him. Hopefully they would understand and could offer her some advice. Her father was a very prominent lawyer with connections and could help Michelle erase John from her life. Not in the way you're thinking. Everybody get your heads and minds out of it. She's not out to kill John. She's out to do it legally, erase her from, erase him from her life. Michelle's mother and father, they were devastated that their daughter had been living a life of hell with John Battaglia. I'm sure her mother took the news slightly worse since it was based on her advice that Michelle not have Christy out of wedlock. Nevertheless, the situation was going to be rectified. Her father began calling in favors to attorneys in Dallas. He was going to make sure his daughter was set up with this bully of a divorce lawyer and would take John to the cleaners and back. Michelle returned to Dallas and she had a different outlook on her situation thanks to her father putting her in touch with a very good attorney to help her fight the divorce from from John. It would be short-lived. Her nanny, a large woman of color, greeted her quickly and was eager to show her what she had found. Her nanny, in my eyes, is a huge part as to why Michelle was able to get away from John and help keep Christy and her son safe. Her nanny was we take no shit kind of girl. Yes, you may pay my paycheck, but if you are putting your hands on the other employer, not take so kindly because us women, we're going to stick together kind of thing. Well, she, the nanny, drug Michelle into the master bedroom and there lie a pile of wire hangers. It's arranged in a semicircle kind of around the bed. And in the middle of the bed, bed is a John-sized imprint. He had set up a trap for her. He laid in the bed they shared in a home that he no longer lived in and surrounded himself with wire hangers so that when she stumbled in from God only knows where, John could hear her, wake up, and then he would give her what she deserves for making him an embarrassment in his own eyes. When Michelle scoured the entire house after seeing what her husband had laid out and was in waiting, she discovered that the gun he had kept in his closet on the shelf was gone. The realization hit. John was going to kill her if she let him. You know that feeling that someone is watching you, but you can't ever seem to pinpoint who is the person staring? Michelle lived with that feeling since her return from her parents' house. She could feel John's harsh stare on her body. Many times he was watching from the bushes as it cloaked him from anybody else seeing what he was doing and and him spying on her. John would hide in the bushes and then he would rush under the garage door before it would close after she pulled her vehicle in. And he would stay down and he would come along, come up to the driver's side of the window and then he'd pop up like a bad nightmare. This terrified Michelle. I'm sure if it was me, none of my organs would be 
located in the torso area. This everything would have exited me quickly. But she managed to outwardly show that she was not terrified of him and she'd merely point to the garage door and she would tell him through the window to get out. Sometimes John would go, sometimes John wouldn't. John knew that this psychological game he was playing with her and he understood it would drive her crazy in the process. And that way, when he finally attacked her, no one would believe this mentally unhealthy, unstable mother over him. His links of manipulation knew no bounds. From behind the stand, Michelle spoke about her marriage to John as they are in the middle of their divorce. She told them about each time he raised his fist to her, each time he lost his temper, and most recently, a beating she took with a bat. A woman who was being attacked by her soon-to-be ex-husband put it on record about his level of abuse. All of this shows why he should not get custody of Christy and why Michelle should not have to pay child and spousal support to him. And in true John fashion, he lost his cool in the middle of the hearing, jumped up screaming at her, calling her a liar. When that didn't elicit the response he wanted, he charged her on the stand, raising his casted fist at her. Thankfully, the bailiffs were there and they were able to restrain John. Needless to say, it didn't bode well for his case. The following week, Judge Gibbs of the 256th court, District Court issued a restraining order against John. John was prohibited from directly communicating with Michelle or with her son. The only contact allowed would be during the pickup of his daughter for his visitation. He was forbidden to enter the home. But this didn't alleviate Michelle's fear in the slightest. Who was going to protect Christy during her time with her father? If John violated this order, he would be fined up to $2,000 or confined to jail for up to one year. Had the courts or the police enforced this order, the outcome of this story could be far different. Michelle was a diligent fighter. Every confrontation, every communication, anything John did was taken down in her records. She would record late night phone calls that he made screaming and harassing her. And for her, it was easier to have her phone number listed so that John could contact her because she felt as if she took that avenue of harassment away from him he would be at her home constantly, and this would only increase the risk of John doing something fatally harmful. On October 26th of 1986, Michelle slept very quietly in her master bedroom. She had doors that led into a patio just outside of the bedroom, and Michelle didn't hear quiet footsteps walking up to those doors. But the sound of the key tripping the tumblers in the lock and the whoosh from the door caused her to open her eyes. She read on the digital clock 12.20 a.m. And standing over her was John. Michelle trembled from the sight of her ex-husband in her bedroom standing over her. She wadded the sheets beneath her in her hands and clenched. She couldn't take a breath and at the same time, she was breathing like she couldn't catch her breath. John placed a hand on her shoulders, holding her down to the mattress. With the other hand, he stroked her head as though he was trying to soothe her in her fears. John offered to calm her with lovemaking, but the very frightened Michelle declined his invitation and his tone changed. How easy would it be for him to snuff her out right then and there? Or he could beat her until she was covered in black and blue bruises. Or he could smother her with the pillow laying next to her. 
John stood at the vantage point here. She was caught off guard and she was left without anything to fight with. John seethed, quote, just wait. I'm going to get you. I will come after you in more ways than you can imagine, end quote. And as quickly as John appeared, he disappeared. Michelle left sweating through her nightgown, fear very pugnant in the air. John needed to be clear with his plan. She needed to know how smart he was in comparison to her. He called shortly after leaving and he said, quote, I've stolen your protective order. Guess what, Michelle? You have no more protection. You're just a whore and a liar. Just wait. I'll show you. This level of harassment was just beginning to make splashes in the pool of crime charges. And I'm talking about the emotional harassment going on on top of the physical domestic violence. People were starting to stand up and say, it's not okay for anyone to endure this level of abuse. But the thing that made this all the more difficult is obtaining copies of papers saying that the victim is protected was no easier than digging into someone's past in 1986. The technology to serve police in their efforts of upholding the court's decisions is bound by the time it took to get paperwork from the courts to the officer, which wasn't moving much faster than that of a civilian off the streets getting the very same papers. Police were bound by the law that stood for everyone and proving harassment was and is damn near impossible. This has changed somewhat throughout the years, but protection orders are almost laughable still 40 years later. It's a piece of paper. It doesn't stop the fist from connecting with the face of the victim. It doesn't stop the bullets that fly through the air intending to kill the target, and it sure as hell doesn't provide enough probable cause for the police to do much about it. The speed of the justice system is why we end up with so many abusers not seeing the inside of a jail cell until there is a body laying at their feet, dead because of the lack of coping capabilities from the abuser and the fists that rain down until they reach their limitations. Men with assaults like those of John should have never progressed, even to this point. Breaking into Michelle's home should have sent John to jail for the entire year outlined in the violation terms of the order. But a smooth-talking lawyer could keep him out of jail, free to attack again and again. The justice system is no better than a woman coming up with an excuse for their abuser and their actions. We're teaching them that they can continue to abuse and abuse until a death occurs. If the abuser is lucky, they can toe that very thin line and just torment their victim for a lifetime. If they can manage to bring themselves from the edge long enough to not commit murder. Michelle called the police from the neighbor's home after John's phone call, and the police dug for the order. But guess what? The order was never filed by Michelle's lawyer. Not with the courts, not to finalize with the courts, not to go to the police, nothing. There was nothing that could be done without that piece of paper. That house was in her name and John's, and according to the law, he had every right to be in his home. Even if the police could see that John was slipping through their fingers and they would love to be able to take him down, but bound by law, their hands were tied. Michelle's attorney verbally attacked her when she went to him and spoke of her disappointment in his inability to file the paperwork. He wasn't going to be told how to practice law. And he was no longer going to work for her because Michelle fired him. And good for you. You are already taking harassment and abuse from one person. You shouldn't have had to take it from the man who is fighting for you in the justice system. 
Michelle knew there's plenty of lawyers out there that would stand within this fight and not be a part of the problem. John continued to break into Michelle's home even after she had the locks changed twice. But it would be no time before John had a set of keys of his own. So she resorted to adding even more deadbolts to the doors. It was like Fort Knox around her home trying to keep her ex-husband out. Once she had a new copy of the protection order, Michelle called the police and filed on John and his violations of the agreement when he broke into her home. John was in violation, and a warrant for his arrest did go out, but this took time as paperwork needed to be filed and signed by proper authorities. John was none the wiser about his pending arrest, and he continued his onslaught directed to Michelle. Once John heard the news that Michelle had filed against him for violating the protection order, he was pissed. So it was time to up his game. John called Michelle's boss at Akin Gump and made up a tall tale of Michelle having an affair with one of the partners within the firm, a very married partner. And if he didn't pressure Michelle to stop the charges, John was going to take what he knew to the press and ruin the company she worked for and her reputation. Well, I'm happy to report he was met with a deafening slam of the phone in the middle of his weightless threat. Ack and Gump was standing behind Michelle. They were fully aware of her ex-husband and his weightless threats. The company had gone to the point, though, to install panic buttons on all four floors of the firm with, funny enough, the headshots he used when modeling hung above those panic buttons. Employees were instructed to press the alarm if any of them seen John in the building. That Thanksgiving holiday gave Michelle the perfect reason to get her and her children out of town. Her next door neighbors, the ones she ran to when John would go off the deep end, were looking after her home while she was away. They phoned one night when they saw John taking the hinges off her back door. While in Baton Rouge, Michelle was helpless, but with everyone she ever knew, they were aware of the protection order and the ongoing ordeal with John. So she called her landlord. Her landlord went to the home and found John standing in the home like he owned it, and it was solely his. Once John was removed from the property, the landlord found three windows that were now unlocked. No doubt left that way so John would have points of entry when Michelle returned home. The thought of putting bars on Michelle's windows was considered, but the landlord feared it would cause a black mark on the community and decided against it. Following Michelle's return to Dallas, she was contemplating a joint custody scenario in which she could live as far away as she could get, hopefully back to Baton Rouge, and John being left in Dallas. But before she could conjure up the outline of that agreement, Michelle received a notice that her car was going to be repossessed because they were forewarned of her decision to default on the loan. Well, with no collateral for the bank, they had to recall her full loan, or her car would be removed from her possession. Come to find out, John had taken advantage of being in her home prior to the landlord showing up and stole her personal records. It took a while, but Michelle was finally able to convince the bank to not take her car because she did not have intentions of taking off with it without paying the note. A week later, John is back to calling and screaming at Michelle. On December 22nd of 1986, John was due in front of the grand jury, a place where lawyers are not allowed. The case would be presented, the facts and the evidence, and then John would be able to talk to the jury and give him his side of all of it. His charges for violating the protection order were up for an indictment, and if he had it his way, he was going to walk out of there with a no bill. What John said to the jury would not be reported, but one can't help but wonder what was said 
that caused them to come back in his favor, leaving Michelle vulnerable to his rage. John made sure to hand deliver this news to Michelle. He was untouchable. Just after New Year's of 1987, John took his harassment further. Following her from the home and onto a freeway, he managed to force her vehicle to the shoulder. And from the front seat of his vehicle, he picked up a rock and threw it at her. She was able to swerve and miss the grapefruit-sized rock and was relieved to know that it did not hit anyone else. John then raised his makeshift gun with his fingers and pretended to fire at her. The threat wasn't lost on Michelle. She knew what John was saying. John was sure that Michelle was going to file against him in his latest violation. And sure enough, out came his arrest warrant and it was shoved into his face just four days after the incident on the freeway. Well, John always walked around with $1,000 cash on him at all times. He had learned his violations generally cost him $100 and a surety bond. The bail would be $1,000. He'd, he'd call a bondsman. They would put up the $1,000. He'd put 10%, which was that $100. However, with this violation, his bond had been changed. It was now $10,000 in cash with no surety bond on this violation. He was not able to go out and call a bondsman. John called his lawyer and gave him the information he needed in order to file paperwork to get his bond reversed back to the $100 surety bond it had always been. After that phone call, John picked up the phone and he called Michelle at work. And he said, quote, well, bitch, aren't you proud of yourself? They have some fucking bond deal here where I have to come up with $10,000 in cold, hard cash. This time, they're going to lock me up. Aren't you as happy as shit about it? You are going to be sorry. Some dark night when you're out by yourself, I can disable your car. And I will be following you. I'll know where you are. Alone with nobody to help you. End quote. John used one of his phone calls from jail to further harass his soon to be ex wife. When John got out, would things be worse? John David Battaglia is one for the record books, a man who had no idea when to stop. Everybody was out to get him. His violent temper wasn't the downfall of his marriage. It was that stupid bitch he married. No one was going to do this to him, least of all a woman. He was going to see his daughter when he wanted, and if that stupid bitch got in his way, she would feel his wrath. John grew up in an abusive household. Whether his father was abusive to Julia, John's mother, in that same nature, it's not known. But you can't help but see the learned behavior magnified in the relationship between John and Michelle. 
But where his mother suffered from depression, Michelle fought to rise above it. She wasn't going down without a fight, and the fight is something John never learned to handle. His desire for praise from his father may be the fuel in his, quote, I'm untouchable mindset, but it was his fuel for the narcissistic disorder John has and had from a very young age. John is going to have order and submissiveness in his home life, even if he has to beat it in to whichever woman takes the place beside him. Michelle feared the man that reared its ugly head that night in Baton Rouge, but the social standards of being with child and unmarried carried enough disappointment she went through with marrying the monster she caught a glimpse of. Had she known he would rain down a fury of this magnitude, wouldn't being a single mother and having that black mark be far better? She was a southern woman raised by a southern woman. We do what we can to make the marriage work. But abuse is where the line is drawn. I want to thank you all for joining tonight as we slide the slippery slope of abuse with both the spouse and the children. If you or someone you know is suffering from domestic abuse, please call 1-800-799-7233. That's one 800 799 safe please remember that internet usage has a digital footprint and it can be tracked so use a phone and call the hotline to get out safely as always i leave you with one last line at any given moment you have the power to say this is not how the story is going to end Much love, the true crime librarian.